Our computers are made up of electronics that resemble this rock. It's solid and absolutely inflexible. But what if they were flexible like our brains, like this piece of clay? How can we build a computer that thinks like a brain? This is the University of the Netherlands. One of the main goals of my research is to discover what materials can do. And if we're lucky enough, use that discovered novelty for a new way to compute. And most of the time, we scientists get stuck, not just on answering complicated questions, but even figuring out what those questions are. But today, I think I can show you a new discovery based on this question. Can we make a material that behaves like a brain? Now, so Alex, <laughs> what do you mean behave like a brain? I think it's fair to say researchers still don't fully understand how the brain here works. The world of neuroscience has been busy with understanding how the brain works for decades, and it still has much to understand. But I think we can all agree that there are elements of our brains that compute. The world of machine learning is focused on this very idea. Let's make algorithms that can harness the basic computing principles of our brains without the more complex psychological aspects of our brains. We, of course, don't want to build a brain-like computer and have it get depressed or have to motivate it to work or have to worry that our computer is going to fall in love with another computer. These basic principles are ideas like classification and pattern recognition, things that can be learned with experience. If I tell a calculator to tell me if a picture is a dog or a cat, it cannot. But I can build an AI program to study the features of dogs and cats, the eyes, the noses, the tongues, the ears of both dogs and cats, and it can start to recognize or classify common features between both of them. It will then learn, and upon seeing a new picture of a dog or a cat, it can tell me which one it is. So before I go on to the fancy science, we have to talk about the ingredients one would need to make something brain-like. And one of those main ingredients is something called plasticity. Now think of plasticity like this piece of clay. If we want to learn different things or make new associations, our brains need to be moldable and reshapable, just like that. Materials that we use today don't often exhibit plasticity. They're more like solid rocks. Now, if I try to change the shape of this material, if I'm lucky, I can pretty much only break it. Let me give you an example now that puts all the stuff that I've said together. I think I can profit from the fact that you all have brains. So here you see a picture of Gouda or Gouda cheese. And after all of the years in the Netherlands, I still haven't learned how to pronounce that correctly. Then I show you a picture of Parmesan cheese and now Superman and Spider-Man, one of my personal favorites. And then a picture of Edmontaler cheese and finally Batman. Now I've taken your very complicated neural networks in your brain and I've trained it. So now I can ask you what goes inside this red triangle? Cheese. We have all just performed the basic tasks I've explained to you. We have created associations between geometrical shape, the color of that shape, and cheeses. We've used the plasticity of our brains to create new and hopefully previously unrelated associations and trained it. You were all able to make a prediction now based on this training data. There are now many links between the shapes, their colors, and the concepts of cheeses and superheroes in your brain. And with that, I can foreshadow a basic idea. While I showed you these images, there was some part of your brain working fast, processing these pictures and trying to organize the information. That fast time scale is what we call neurons. The process of learning and scrambling the data into some semblance of an order or pattern is a slow process, and that slow process we call synapses. And this is an idea I will come back to later in my lecture. But it boils down to creating these two essential computational units in machine learning, neurons, which fluctuate fast, and synapses, which exhibit plasticity. They slowly change and are tasked with remembering and ultimately learning. 
So why should we want to make materials that can do this autonomously instead of just writing a computer program? Our fancy computers today can do this, run apps, run programs, but the problem is that they don't do this very efficiently. I also personally believe that if we look at the first computer chips ever designed, take a look at this picture, the inventors and scientists didn't certainly envision that computers back then would do all that they can do today. So let's take a simple example, the self-driving car. A self-driving car has to be able to recognize the edge of a road and distinguish that from a pedestrian and make fast decisions. It's been conjectured that 30 to 40% of the energy of the whole car is used just for the computer, not actually driving the car. Imagine that. We can do these things with little effort, fueled on French fries and potato chips and probably multitask and sing to the radio while we're at it. That means there's a huge efficiency gap between the energy needed for these tasks and what can potentially be done. And considering the urgent need for a greener society, it's important, it's imperative to find energy efficient ways to compute. So why is this so inefficient? Think about the notion of memory. The notion of memory for a computer may be a USB stick. A USB stick is built in such a way that if you put information on it, for example, you store a picture, you want that picture to stay exactly the way it is no matter what. Doesn't matter if it rains, if you haven't had a cup of coffee, it should remember every last detail of that picture you stored and it should never ever change until you tell it to do so. It takes energy to hold this information perfectly and you have to pay this energy to change it. As for our brains, we can't always remember every last detail. Like with the calculator example, our brains are low precision. If I ask you to remember the very same picture, you've certainly probably forgotten certain aspects of the picture. You may also see other pictures that remind you of this original picture, or with just a piece of this original picture, you may actually recall the full picture. Memory for us, in our brains, it's very noisy and it's very different than the very rigid and stable way memory is built into a computer. To be able to create hardware that can perform pattern recognition like our brain does, we need to make a fundamental shift in the way we design a computer. We need materials like this piece of clay that can be shaped based on their experiences. They need to be inherently noisy and flexible but also able to adapt based on the experiences that they have. We need materials with plasticity. Let's come back to the idea of neurons and synapses, the building blocks or the Legos of the brain. In this picture, the circles are neurons and they can be of one of two colors. Now let's just take a look at two of them. We can observe them and count when they blink and see if they blink with each other or not and then count that over course of time, for example, over a minute. And over each second, we can ask ourselves, did they fire together or not? What colors were they? We can then, after counting this, make a plot of the distribution, and that is what you see in yellow here. The numbers on the bottom represent whether they've blinked together or not. This distribution defines a pattern of data, and it's ultimately such a distribution that we can define as a memory and be used to classify data. Now comes the important part. This distribution that I show you, it depends on the way these two neurons are coupled. Coupling is the job of the synapse. It should remain the same unless it learns or adapts itself. So if we started with super heroes, and now we wanna flip the distribution to the cheese, we have to change the synapse itself. As a result, the way the two neurons fire together will also change and we will get a different distribution or a different pattern. And that's the elegant idea of plasticity. The preference to form a certain distribution can be molded. Remember a piece of clay? There's some kind of recognizable property that now tells the system, instead of alternating while you flip, I want you to flip together. The synapse is the memory that tells us which distribution is linked to the cheese and which is linked to the superhero. We need plasticity to create a brain-like material. In our example of superheroes and cheese, your neurons were continuously firing as you processed each image. And as patterns started becoming associated with the cheese and superheroes, the synapses changed and learned these associations. 
So now let's turn to the new science. We need to make neurons that fire, and we need to make synapses that can change the way they fire together. In Nijmegen, we found a way to make these neurons and synapses down to one of nature's fundamental limits, the level of individual atoms. We've made a material called black phosphorus. It's a crystal, and it's made from the elements on the periodic table, phosphorus. Using one of the highest resolution microscopes in the Netherlands, we can see these atoms in this crystal, and that's these zigzag patterns you see in the picture. Each of these dots is an atom in the zigzag. Now, let me remind you of the scale bar here. This is about a meter. What we're looking at is a billion times smaller than a meter. We found that if we go down the periodic table away from phosphorus and we sprinkle cobalt on the surface, we can actually create neurons and synapses. We found that each cobalt atom initially can appear like a little goldfish, and that's what you see in this picture. And we found something very, very odd. If we zap this goldfish with electricity, it switches itself into a mushroom. And this process is reversible based on the electric shock. If we don't zap it, it stays the way that it is. If we put on more electricity, it even starts fluctuating, much like one neuron would. In this way, the fluctuations between it looking like a goldfish and a mushroom identically represent the example of the circles I just previously showed you. In this way, we can start making neurons from atoms, but yet it still remains to be seen if we can control the way these neurons may talk to each other and if we can make synapse. In other words, we still haven't exactly figured out what the piece of clay is. Using our microscope, we can precisely position these atoms in a pattern we want them to be in. We wanted to observe how these atoms may talk to each other. Do they recognize that there's another atom nearby? If these two atoms behave brain-like, they'll flip into all of these four configurations I just showed you, and we should be able to create a yellow barred graph distribution like the one I showed you previously. In other words, we could map different spikings of whether we're in the goldfish or mushroom state for these two atoms and link this to this yellow chart. Look at the signal chart here. We can see the number of spikes between goldfish and mushroom and count the amount of times that we see these spikes and make a distribution, just like the distribution I showed you before with cheeses and superheroes. So these two atoms are neurons, and these are our neurons, just like the circles I showed before. That means we can host the most elementary set of neurons from these atoms, and now we're faced with the daunting task of making a synapse. We need to change this distribution. So how do we do that? We found this serendipitously. We found that if we actually stack these atoms in the configuration you see, with two being horizontal and one being vertical, we found that the bottom two still flip between the goldfish and mushroom states that I told you about, but the third one stays stationary. But the third one tells the bottom two how to flip. And this way, we've identically created a synapse. So what does this all mean? We can create a system with two neurons that have four different states. We can create a distribution. And now by putting an atom on top of it and using electricity, we can create an atom that mimics a synapse and becomes the memory and tells what the firing neurons what to do or which distribution to be in. For example, one distribution can be used to represent the classes of cheese and triangles, and another one can be used to represent a class of superheroes and circles. This is actually the smallest synapse anyone has ever made, and we therefore like to call this the atomic scale synapse. I want to say that many smart people have been working on making materials brain-like, we are not the first. However, this is a first example of something showing the ingredients of a brain at this scale, and the scale of individual atoms. As this is the scale of what some people would call quantum, due to its sheer size, we started calling this the pathway towards a quantum brain. This material may be atomic scale, but remember, our brain has 80-odd billion neurons and many synapses. This platform only has two neurons and one synapse. There's still a lot more to do before we can say we've reached the goal of making anything brain-like or anything quantum brain-like. We have shown that this material can adapt itself, but there's still a lot more to understand and ultimately figure out what we can do with this material. 
We started this lecture with the question, how can we build a computer that thinks like a brain? With this lecture, I showed you we work on materials that function like a brain. So what we've accomplished so far is that we've created atomic scale neurons and synapses. They have plasticity and they're adaptive. But the challenge for the future is to use these properties of these materials, ultimately start memorizing superheroes and cheeses, and see if we can scale this up to the numbers of neurons and synapses that exist in the brain. And let's not forget the energy efficiency as well. Suffice to say, we have a lot more to learn. Thank you for listening.